Welcome. I'm David Robinson, Conservation Chair for the Central Piedmont Group of the Sierra Club. In the video you are about to see, Dr. Joe Parisi is speaking on the subject of finding refuge and nourishment during difficult times. The idea for this program came to us when an executive committee member said that she had been feeling too stressed out by current politics and climate change denial and that this was impacting her Sierra Club effort. We realize that most of us have had similar feelings and most especially recently. So we decided to host a presentation on the psychological aspects of stress that advocates face. During our search, Dr. Joe Parisi came highly recommended. Dr. Joe is a licensed clinical psychologist who has been in private practice in Charlotte for over 30 years. During that time, he established Presbyterian Hospital's Center for Mind-Body Health and co-founded the Center for Integrative Medicine. Prior to that, he was the director of psychology at Charter Pines Hospital, where he developed and directed the hospital's anxiety disorders program. The Central Piedmont Group of the Sierra Club is pleased to share Dr. Joe's presentation with you. We hope you find it as meaningful as we have. And now, here's Dr. Joe. What I intend for tonight, there, you know, there's a lot of common sense things that we could talk about. I could talk about, well, you need to exercise, you need to eat well, you need to get politically active, and all those things can help offset uh, uh, the depression and the despair that come. Um, but I want to focus instead specifically on just a psychological side of it that can be called many things, and I'm going to use the metaphor of opening our hearts. Because in situations like this, where we feel like we're under attack from so many sides. It's easy to get angry, it's easy to get bitter, it's easy to get discouraged, all of which are perfectly normal. But if we're not careful in that process, we will begin to move into the direction of anxiety, where it becomes chronic, we can move into the direction of depression, um, we begin to get uh, paralyzed, in our behavior so we're no longer taking effective action and that's where we get in trouble. So I want to talk about opening our hearts rather than closing our hearts during difficult times such as this. And I'm going to break it down into three parts and primarily focus on, on two of them. The first is opening our hearts to ourselves. How do we keep ourselves alive in this process with all that's going on and all that we're experiencing? Secondly, how do we open our hearts to others? Okay. Especially, perhaps, uh, the people who are now in the legislature. And finally, from a psychological perspective, keeping our hearts open to however and what we define as a higher force in the universe is also important. Um, at the end of the talk, I, I want to um, give you all the opportunity to do a brief meditation, and then after that I'll be happy to take some questions. I've also brought some handouts for you at the end that I'll talk about as uh, we go along. Um, but first let me just talk about ourselves and, and, and what happens with us, and, and it's important to, to understand that we're, in some ways we're jinxed as humans. And the reason I say we're jinxed is because the normal processes of the human mind will invariably lead us down a path that can become very destructive and produce suffering. And in particular, what, what I mean when I say that is that we're endowed by our DNA, to, or excuse me, our DNA to be able to anticipate what we think is going to happen in the future. And from an evolutionary perspective, if we didn't have that capability, it's doubtful we would have survived as a species. But what happens is that capability is a good trait that quickly gets out of control. And especially with everything going on now, it is so easy to stand back and the mind just takes off with horrific consequences of what we're afraid is going to happen. Nationally, what we're afraid is going to happen to us individually. Um, I was at a conference this um, 
past weekend where I heard a speaker talk about how for her it was like having a, a radio station in her mind. WDPC, wholly devoted to possible catastrophes. <laughs> 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just to make sure that she never forgot about any catastrophe that could possibly occur. And the reality is we all have a radio station like that in our mind. And it can quickly get out of control. The second tendency we have as humans that can get us in trouble is that we have a tendency to avoid suffering. Now, in some ways, of course, that's good. Nobody wants to suffer, um, myself included. Um, but the difficulty is that when suffering is, is, is external, because we don't have a, a, enough food or we don't have enough water, we can take action. But when it's internal, okay, so now the suffering is we're feeling discouraged or we're feeling depressed. We can't just go out and change where we live or, or engage in some external action so quickly to change those emotions. It doesn't work that way emotionally. And instead, what people will often do is seek what I would call false refugees, um, drinking, gambling, shopping. My latest favorite one is internet addiction. Okay. Where, in essence, what we're trying to do is run away from our emotions and trying to bury them, trying to push them aside, trying to forget about them and not deal with them. Uh, work addiction. Addictions are not always oriented towards negative behaviors. It's um, possible to uh, work too much, and it's possible also to do, um, and I'll apologize to Dave and Phil as I say this, but it's, it's possible to engage in too much charity work. There are some folks who get so outer involved, and everyone around will say, golly, Dave, look at that person. They're doing so well with everything that they're doing. They'll show up in my office, and they'll talk to me about, they don't have time to take care of themselves. They don't have time for their husband. Their, their lives become out of balance. So the tendency to, to run from ourselves and run from our emotions is, is, is natural. But what happens that when it gets out of control, when our thinking is 24-7, nothing but bad news, we're thinking typically in black and white terms, we're doing what we call emotional reasoning, um, we're magnifying what's happening, um, and in order to get away from the feelings we're trying to self-medicate or, or do whatever, is that we begin to fragment our own consciousness. We begin to take the emotions and push them down so that we have a, 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 a set of emotions inside of us that we are doing everything to avoid experiencing and um, simply running away from, our, from them. And in essence, what we're doing is we're running away from ourselves. And the, the danger is that when we're running from ourselves, we will always be running from something inside of us and we'll never find peace. A lot of the people I see who come into my office who are depressed, underneath as we begin to talk, it's not unusual that they have a lot of anger that they've run from. Um, there often is a cultural bias with that too that I'll mention in that women are taught in our society typically not to get angry men are taught not to feel sad and cry it's fine if you're a guy to go in a bar and right hook someone but Lord knows you shouldn't break down into tears and if you're a woman Lord knows you shouldn't get angry and so we get on top of um, everything else, we get cultural um, messages about what's an acceptable feeling and what's not an acceptable feeling. And we will also get messages from our family. In some families, anger is okay. In other families, it's not okay. In some families, it's okay to show emotions. In another family, it's not okay to have any emotions. So we end up invariably 
taking significant parts of ourselves if we're not careful and feeling like this is a bad part of me. These feelings are not okay. That leads to increased feelings of discouragement and despair. We feel like there's something wrong with us. And what we have to do, coming back to the metaphor, is turn that around and re-own and reconnect, open our hearts, if you will, to what we're feeling, the entire totality to what we're feeling. In essence, we have to bring our presence, our emotional awareness, to who we are, here and now, not who we want to be, but who we are. There's a particular vehicle that, as a psychologist, I've become interested in, um, in uh, actually for many years now, and it's the concept of mindfulness, which perhaps you've heard of. It's hard, actually, to miss it now. It's in the uh, media so much. But the idea is that in our minds, we're constantly thinking of the future, as I talked about before, the past. Um, we're always living as though we're going to have happiness and peace of mind in the future as soon as certain conditions are met. Remember when you were in high school and the answer was, well, as soon as I graduate high school, I'll be happy. <laughs> and then it goes from there. Well, as soon as I graduate college, as soon as I get married, as soon as I get rid of this spouse, <laughs> it, just goes, it just goes on and on. Um, and we're always living as though the next moment is going to be better. And we lose touch with the present moment. So with the concept of mindfulness, being able to take our awareness back to the present moment with compassion, and through the practice of mindfulness, bring our own presence back to ourselves so that we can open our hearts to all of who we are, and so that if we're feeling discouraged, it's just the opposite. It's if, if one is feeling discouraged and feeling despair, the way through it is to accept it. It's kind of like Chinese handcuffs. Do you remember Chinese handcuffs when you were a kid? Put two fingers in, and the more you pull against it, the more you get caught. Well, that's what happens psychologically in our mind. The more we pull against our emotions, the more we pull against the discouragement, that we might feel the despair, depression perhaps, if it's setting in, the more we're going to get stuck. And we have to go in the opposite direction. We have to first accept what's happening so that we can then take wise action and know what to do. In opening our hearts to ourselves and in bringing our mindfulness to ourselves, um, there are two paths that I'll mention. Um, the first is an outer path. And this is going to be any practice which brings you peace of mind and a sense of being able to connect with yourself. This can be hiking. It could be yoga. Going on retreats. Maybe coming to talks like this. I don't know yet. <laughs> we'll see. Um, relaxation exercises, it could be anything, but any activity that allows you to feel more connected with yourself. And then there's an inner path, which is a little different and is not supported a whole lot in our society, but the inner path is stopping. Just stopping and pausing. To such a great extent in our society, we emphasize doing. The last statistics I saw, we work more hours on average in the United States than any other country in the world now. We've even surpassed Japan, and they were pretty crazy. Yeah. But sometimes we just have to stop and pause and just be with ourselves. Just be with whatever we're experiencing, bringing our full presence to who we are. There's a, um, a metaphor I, I, I like to share with um, patients about how we work with emotions, and it comes from a, um, uh, a Zen Buddhist monk by the name of Thich Nhat Hanh, 
where he talks about, imagine our consciousness is like a house. And in the living room is where we live. That's our awareness. But perhaps not so much in the south. But most houses have a basement, or at least a crawl space. Um, and in the basement of our minds are all our memories. It's where your telephone number is stored. And it's also where all your emotions are stored. Which is why sometimes you might be in the car and you turn on a song and an emotion pops up. Because that song is associated with certain events or situations in your life. Well, those emotions were in the basement of our mind. And what typically happens is we may be in the living room having a perfectly nice day when all of a sudden, and there's no knock on the door, it just barges through. But in barges, perhaps it's depression, perhaps it's despair, perhaps it's anxiety. And our tendency is to reach down in the chair we're sitting in, pick up a club, and try to whack the dame <laughs> the heck out of it and throw it back down the stairs. And back to the idea of the Chinese handcuffs. As soon as we do this, as soon as we start fighting with it, all we've really succeeded in doing is creating World War III inside ourselves. It doesn't lead to peace. And instead what we have to do, and I'm going to use a metaphor inside a metaphor here, is to think of uh, what a parent does with a newborn baby. It doesn't have to be a newborn, but any child uh, who's in the crib and begins to cry. Where we instinctively go over and we bring our full presence to this child. And we pick up the baby. And we hold the baby with as much tenderness, typically, as we can. Now, sometimes just our presence alone is enough so that the baby will stop crying. And if it's not, the act of holding the baby will allow us to hopefully get a better sense of what the baby needs. Is the diaper wet? Is the baby hungry? Is it feverish? So that we know how to proceed. And this is what we want to learn to do with our emotions. So that when we're in our living room and despair walks in through the door, we're able to say, can hear my little despair <laughs> and let me hold you. The difference is we don't want the despair to kidnap us because it's when these emotions kidnap us that we get in trouble. But instead, if, if, if despair is here, we want to create a, an equal energy force here of mindfulness, of awareness, and using this force to gently hold this part of ourselves. Understanding that it's when we can touch with compassion and mercy the parts of us that are wounded and hurting, that that's when they heal. They don't heal when we bring anger and rejection to them. So opening our hearts to ourselves. I have a poem I'd like to share with you um, from Dorothy Hunt. She writes, do you think peace will come some other place than here, some other time than now, and some other heart than yours? Peace is this moment without judgment, that is all. This moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. Peace is this moment without thinking that it should be some other way, that you should feel some other thing, that your life should unfold according to your plans. Peace is this moment without judgment. This moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. <coughs> opening our hearts to ourselves and then secondly, opening our hearts to others. We um, 
we forget we all belong to each other. I'd like to um, uh, share with you an article um, uh, by Fred Rogers, who Mr. Rogers actually was one of my heroes. Um, and um, he wrote, actually if I remember right, he, he, this was part of a, uh, a graduation uh, speech that he gave. And he said, have you heard the story that came out of the Seattle Special Olympics? For the 100-yard dash, there were nine contestants, all of them so-called physically or mentally disabled. All nine of them assembled at the starting line, and at the sound of the gun, they took off. But one little boy didn't get very far. He stumbled and fell and hurt his knee and began to cry. The other eight children heard the boy crying. They slowed down, turned around, and ran back to him. Every one of them ran back to him. One little girl with Down syndrome bent down and kissed the boy and said, this will make it better. The little boy got up and he and the rest of the runners linked their arms together and joyfully walked to the finish line. They all finished the race at the same time and when they did, everyone in the stadium stood up and clapped and whistled and cheered for a long time. People who were there are still telling the story with obvious delight. And do you know why? Because deep down we know that what matters in this life is more than winning for ourselves. What really matters is helping others win too, even if it means slowing down and changing our course now and then. How easy it is to forget that, or to get caught in the pushes and pulls of um, daily life. I think um, as we grow up, because of the pressures we have, and, and a way to look at it, I'm, I know I'm using a lot of metaphors tonight, I'll give you another one, that we quickly will get a sense of what we need to do to survive in the environment that we're growing up in. And if you can imagine it like a spacesuit. You know, when the astronauts are up in space, they can't go for a spacewalk, obviously, without a suit to protect themselves from the elements. And as we're growing up in a family, because of the pressures, because of whatever is happening in our family, every one of us here has developed a spacesuit of some thickness and of some caliber. And of course, everybody's spacesuit will be a little bit different. And it's good that we did that because we wouldn't have survived without that ability. But what happens is the spacesuits begin to isolate us. It makes it hard to connect with each other and to, to be present for each other. And we begin to get a sense that I'm different from everyone else. You know, if people really knew the real me, they wouldn't like me, that kind of feeling not deep down inside. Maybe I've got everybody fooled. I had the uh, opportunity over the years to treat uh, many high-level executives uh, here in Charlotte who come in and they look at me and the first thing they'll say is, I'm an imposter. Everybody thinks I know what I'm doing and I'm confident. I've got them all fooled. I'm scared to death. If we could create a helmet, if I had brought a helmet with me today and I said, you know, if you put on this helmet, what's it, what it's going to do is it's going to broadcast your, all your thoughts out loud. <laughs> do I have a volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody would volunteer. <laughs> but most people would get frightened. Not, don't get near me with that helmet. I don't want people to know what I'm really thinking. But the real tragedy is, if I had brought 35 helmets, or however many of us there are, and we put them on, we'd all find that deep down we're all pretty much thinking the same kind of stuff. That we're all human. Um, in opening our hearts to each other, the first part that we're going to keep coming back to, that we have to take a risk and do over and over again, is a willingness to be vulnerable. 
there's a lot of research out now. There's a wonderful TED talk. Um, her last name is Brown, and I'm forgetting her first name. About the research that's being done um, on the willingness to be vulnerable, and in essence, what it shows is that the more we're willing to take a risk and let somebody see us and see us below just a surface level, then the healthier we are and the more we're able to interconnect. But we have to be willing to tolerate that feeling of vulnerability where we're really not quite sure if the other person's going to accept us. We have to be willing to take that risk. And of course, we have to um, know how to connect with others. Just as a quick aside, I meant to mention this uh, a little earlier that this is true not only for humans, it's true for interactions even as we're, we're interfacing with animals. Okay, now there's a ton of research out about what happens when people are sick or depressed and they get a dog or they get a cat. When uh, I was at uh, Presbyterian Hospital with Dr. Doran Blazer, uh, we actually would bring a dog up to the unit. This was before managed care. Uh, just to help pick up people's uh, uh, boots. There was a, a research finding at the University of Ohio, and like most research findings, this one was uh, acci an accidental finding. They were feeding rabbits a diet, and these were all genetically um, predisposed rabbits to get uh, heart disease. So they're feeding them this, this diet. They know they're all going to get heart disease, and they're giving half the rabbits uh, medication hoping to prevent uh, clogging in the arteries, and the other half were just getting the diet, and they wanted to see how, um, how, the, how well the medication was working. Well, something was going wrong, and they didn't know what it was because um, some of the rabbits who should have been getting heart disease weren't getting heart disease, not the way they should have been, or was, they would have been expected to. And so the researchers got really interested in this, a true story, I kid you not. They got really interested. They thought, what could be going on? Maybe, well, maybe it's the light switches. Maybe the rabbits closer to lights get less heart disease, or maybe it's the air conditioning ducts, or the sound, or... They went through everything they could think of. Nothing played out. They couldn't correlate it with anything. Until one day, somebody said, well, how about the graduate assistant who feeds the rabbits? Well, what they found was that the graduate assistant was an animal lover. <laughs> and she was also very short. And in the cages at the University of Ohio, they would be on a wall like that, so they'd go all the way up to the top. And she would feed all the rabbits. She'd somehow get the food up. And the cages where she could reach were the bottom cages. She'd reach in and she'd pet those rabbits. Well, the rabbits that received the petting and the love and affection from her develop heart disease 60% less than the rabbits that were not cut. That somehow the experience of love and affection changed their physiological metabolism so that they were processing uh, the food and they were staying healthier. The research on humans is the same. The more isolated we are, the more likely we are to get ill. If we get ill, the more likely we are to have a difficult time. We need connection with others. Um, often people, or oftentimes people will say, well, you know, what, what do I have to do to connect? What, it's all, what is it all about? Well, a willingness to be vulnerable is a first part. Um, but I'll share with you the three other parts that um, we emphasize, particularly when uh, we're doing group therapy, is that in order to connect with each other, we have to be able to do three things. The first is we have to be aware of our emotions when we're having them. If I'm not aware of my emotions, it's going to be hard for me to talk to you about them. Secondly, we have to know how to express them in a healthy manner. We've got to learn how to 
let someone know how we're feeling in a way that minimizes the chance that they'll be defensive and that they'll just get like this and not listen to everything that we're saying. And then the third part is we need to learn to listen. And listening is going to come back to opening our heart to the other person, that we need to learn to hear what we're saying from their point of view. That listening is really one of the oldest tools of healing. And it is oftentimes the quality of our listening and the quality of trying to hear what the other person is saying that allows them to feel touched and feel connected. When um, I'm working with uh, couples or groups of people who are having trouble getting along, the ground rule that I'll express at the very beginning is always seek to understand before being understood. Okay. And it doesn't mean that we agree necessarily with what other people are saying, but that we're simply trying to let them know that we can understand. And this is how I would define opening our hearts to others, but by trying to understand, by bringing our caring and our compassion to them, um, this becomes important. The third area of connection is what I'm going to call a higher force, where you know most of us um, have had moments where we felt we were a part of something much larger than ourselves. Okay. For some people who are religious, they'll call that God, and other folks who are secular, it may just be nature. We are out walking in nature. Okay. Or it may just be energy. I, I, I love Star Wars where they say, may the force be with you. <laughs> I think that was part of the attraction of, of that initial trilogy, that that's what they were pulling on. And, and, and my point is not to tell you what your conception or your understanding should be, or even if you should have a particular conception, but rather that it's when we experience that connection, whether you're out walking on a trail and you experience yourself as part of the larger universe as a whole, that we begin to transcend feelings of isolation, and we can begin to heal. I read the other day, um, again going back to uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, where he was talking about Mother Earth, and he simply said, you are Mother Earth. And I thought, yeah, that's right. But where else does my body come from? That there's really not a separation. All of us are Mother Earth. black elk in Indian once said peace comes within the souls of men when they realize their connection with the universe so what I'd like to do is give all of you a chance to put into practice just a little bit what I'm talking about today, and if you wish, you can follow along. If not, if you just want to listen and, and watch, that's okay too. But I'd like to invite all of us to bring our awareness back to this present moment and coming back to ourselves. So, doing a brief guided meditation, let me invite you if you're sitting in a chair, you've got your feet crossed, it would be helpful to put them both on the floor. That helps ground us. And I know many of you in this room already have a meditation practice. That's okay. Uh, and if you've never meditated before, that's okay. Get a tape.
Well, I'd like to end tonight with um, what is called a meta meditation, which is the expression of um, an intention. And as part of the meditation, I would simply like to say to you that may you learn, or perhaps I should say all of us, may we all learn to look at ourselves through the eyes of love and compassion. And may we be able to recognize and touch the seeds of joy and peace in us. Thank you.